Welcome to People I Know Show, a podcast about interesting people, personal growth, and being wrong. I'm Kurt Karstensen. Joining me today on episode 15 of the podcast is Matt Donnelly. I first became aware of Matt in the fall of 2015 as he is one of the hosts of one of my favorite podcasts to listen to, Penn's Sunday School, which is also hosted by Penn Gillette of Penn and Teller fame. I've crossed paths with Matt on a few occasions since then, and he's one of the people I reached out to for advice in the early stages of developing this podcast, People I Know Show. I've admired Matt's work ethic and the different areas of the entertainment industry that he's involved with as he continues to grow his notoriety and his career. I was in Las Vegas recently, and Matt and I recorded this episode while he was driving us in his car, although I don't think you'll notice much noise related to that. This is actually the third episode now that I've recorded while driving in a car. Please take a few moments to leave a rating and a review of People I Know show on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen. Until recently, no ratings or reviews were showing up on Apple Podcasts, so I got in touch with Apple support, then some ratings appeared, and now I see they've disappeared again. I'm not sure what's the issue, but I'd be pleased to see more ratings and reviews appear, including yours. Search for and follow People I Know show on Facebook or Instagram to see photos and other content related to the show. You can find links to those pages and much of what Matt Donnelly is currently involved with in this episode's show notes. Plus, check out the article about intellectual humility that we'll discuss. Now, on to the conversation with Matt Donnelly. Joining me today on People I Know Show is Matt Donnelly. Hello, Matt. Hi, how's it going? It's going well. This is uh, kind of a unique, early in the People I Know Show podcast, kind of a unique situation for me. You you, you rank up or rank down up as one of the couple of people I know the least, but yet I feel like I know enough to have on my show. So congratulations. There you go. I'm here to stretch boundaries. That's my job. So a quick background Based on my memory, and we'll see how much of this you remember. And I don't expect you remember any of it necessarily. Oh, good. But I first met you, you did a comedy improv show in Minneapolis like two to three years ago, I think. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I love Minneapolis. I came out for that. A friend and I, and we, we met you, chat a little bit before or after the show or something. Was it, it was not the time I came out with Penn, but a different time? No, it was a different time. I forget who you were with. It was at the big improv, I think, somewhere in yeah, uptown yeah. Minneapolis, but yeah. Huge. I'd, huge. There we go. Huge. That's huge improv theater. Just, yeah. Love that theater. Love the, love those guys. Butch Roy, Jill Bernard. Good folks out there. Good improv community out in Minneapolis. Yeah. There's a few different venues. And I've actually taken an improv class one time for like four sessions, which helped me a little. But I realize there probably needs to be a lot of practice at that to ever have a chance to be even close to good. Well, you know, it's, it, uh, improv classes exist all over the country. I'm a big improv teacher and I've taught all over the country. And, uh, you know, the fact that you are like right now, like a podcaster, like that to me is great. Like, I think improv classes are like a great place to go for that. I think improv classes improve so many things. And I don't think you have to be at like super performance level, amazing at it to reap the benefits of it, you know? And, uh, you know, because I'm an improv nerd and I make this point before, which is, is like, uh, improv is a social movement. You know, it's it's the foundation of it. it was invented by this woman, Viola Spolin. She taught and works in the WPA, works programs for artists, you know, Great Depression. She taught in work camps, build confidence in teens, build confidence in adults. And it's her son who started Second City with well, a compass. And then a year later, the Second City and said, let's make a comedy. So that the, the what you learned in your class is just for to make people better at being people. And how did you first get introduced to it and how did it kind of stick for you? I was invited. A friend of mine's older brother was performing in this show called Improv Jam in Redback, New Jersey. And I uh, went uh, at like 15 years old, a freshman in high school, and saw the show. I never had heard of an improv show. And when someone told me what the show was going to be, it was like a, it was like a comedy sports show. So, you know, they're doing, you know, games where they move people around like puppets, doing games where you film their sentences, where they change, you know, do a scene and change genres, and they do like a talk show and a dating game. And, and I was like, what they were describing sounded like impossible to me. And I was like, what am I going to see? Like, this sounds crazy. So how do I, how do I, uh, like, what am I going to see? And then I went and saw it. And it was, you know, like, you know, like, like a comedy sports show you'd seen any, any place, but I'd never seen anything like it. And I 
absolutely fell in love. Of course, I volunteered to go up on stage and be a part of a game. And, uh, and I just was like, and that was happening every Friday and Saturday in my hometown. And, uh, and that's what I started doing. So like every weekend I spent my entire high school, uh, going to this improv show and then eventually doing this improv show. So as I mentioned, met you briefly the first time in Minneapolis. And then I came to Las Vegas for the national bowling tournament, which I, Oh know yeah. How, you know, they let anybody be a, a part of that as, as Get I found out. Of town. Up. Yeah. It's not so a, not a picky, no, not a no. picky convention over no, there at the it, bowling it festival. Isn't. It isn't, but I was in town for that. <laughs> Maybe the worst bowler involved. And uh, come on, but, well, uh, I'll go next year if you want to be the second worst bowler. Okay, I'm okay. a terrible bowler. It's very convenient for you. I think it's just uh, cross yeah. away at what South Point. Anyhow, oh, yeah. so that week I happened to be in town. I saw you a couple other times, real briefly. You had been doing, and I think it sounds like you're doing this again for a short term, an improv show you called the Bucket Show. Yes, yeah, we just brought it back for four shows. Uh, we're, our second one is tomorrow night, as we speak, at the time of this recording. So there'll be maybe one or two left by the time anyone hears us speak. And the Bucket Show, it was like a really, and maybe it still is, a late start Wednesday night thing. And I thought, you know, I can show up to this and just kind of see what happens. And I don't know how it compares at any given time, but there was, I don't know, a few dozen people there. And you Yeah, it's 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 a casual hang. And it's and it's that way for a person. Like Paul and I, my comedy partner Paul Mattingly, uh, co-host of Matt and Mattingly's Ice Cream Social. Um we love improv. We've been doing it our whole lives, you know. Uh, and so um, the bucket show is really just to keep us sharp while we try to figure out a way to do it more often. <laughs> it, it is like the worst show time and, you know, like <laughs> possible because it's if we did it at like midnight, we'd actually probably be better off because then we get all the people who get out of their like shows, like circus shows and stuff. Um, but the Wednesday night thing, we don't want to stay up that late as who we are with what we do with our jobs and, uh, and my children and everything. Mm -hmm. And then if we would love to do it at like eight o'clock and I think it'd be more popular there, but we were renting, we have a cheap rental agreement with the theater. And so we, we agree to go into the theater after they're done rehearsing or putting on whatever show they're putting on at their theater. So we do the, uh, amazing showtime of 10 30 PM, which allows us to get, like you said, a couple dozen people to come check us out. And I, I, I didn't know what to expect, but I really enjoyed it. And the concept, as you can better explain, is anyone can show up. No yeah. one has to pay you anything. But if you want to go throw some money at you at the end of it, that's how it goes. And I, I really like the concept of entertainment like that or anything like that. I think that's kind of the world's moving there slightly, where instead of committing to pay for something before you see it, just go and, and watch it and be as generous as you're capable and willing to be. Yeah, I mean, we jokingly say that we're panhandling indoors or, you know, we're doing indoor street performances. Uh, but the, the truth is that we came up with it because, uh, like, w Las Vegas, you know, uh, I moved here from, you know, New York. And my buddy Paul, uh, comedy partner Paul, moved here from Kentucky. <laughs> and one of the fascinating things about living in Las Vegas is it's a tiny city that really doesn't have a lot of uh, barriers. Like, there's no pretentiousness to it. And so, like, Paul and I joke all the time. Like, we're friends with, like, the poorest people we've ever known. And we're friends with, like, the richest people we've ever known in this town. <laughs> you know? And so, for some people, like, $5 is a lot. And for other people, $20 is nothing. Yep. And so, the Bucket Show was actually a way to just, like stop pricing ourselves out or in on that department you know and so you know for our improv students or, or people who are struggling just taking classes just starting off an improv or something they can come to the show for free you know they can just come see it and check it out and for our friends that twenty dollars is nothing they'll throw twenty dollars at it you know and if we charge five bucks they would have just paid five yeah exactly and so it turns out to work out quite well um uh, you know, it's the most, it's oddly the most consistently, we don't make a lot of money, but it's the most consistently paying thing we've done since we've been in Vegas. So I, I went to the show that night. I, I don't know if I threw 10 or 20, but at, at, that, there you point, go. at that point, I don't know how rich I was compared to now, but probably, probably I'd get you more to, to uh, if I could be in town tomorrow, I'd get you more that day. Okay. Anyhow, that's neither here nor there. <laughs> so the, the, the day after that, then I recall you had as the podcast that you're on that first introduced me to you, Penn Sunday School, you had something at like the some kind of a science or education center 
where it was like uh, I, I forget who was on uh, uh, Seesaw, the Center for Science and Wonder here in Las Vegas. And you had a guest recording a couple of those episodes and paid to get in there. And I think all the funds went to that that school or that organization. Yep, yep. And saw a live recording of Penn Sunday School, chatted with you real briefly again that day, told you that day that I was thinking about starting a podcast, and at some point I'd reach out to you. So that's kind of the long way to get to how this conversation's happening. And you, you gave me a little bit of advice, and the fact that I reached out to you and you, you made the time for me while I was in town this trip is, uh, is great. And, and I think if I can pull it this way for a second, Matt, the fact that we are actually talking right now, driving in Las Vegas, as I've done a few times before for my episodes, yeah. I, I, it reflects on you and the type of people that maybe I'm drawn to that are willing to go out of their way for some guy that they barely know for really at what purpose doesn't necessarily <laughs> serve for you. But I love that. I want to be that person or I think I am that person. So someone like you is just that that's what I'm drawn to and I'm happy that you're willing to take the time to do something like this. Uh, yeah. I mean, I, 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 I like, uh, yeah, I, I remember giving you advice about podcasting. I was happy you're doing it. And I, I, I think this is, uh, just my way of being more enthused for you, uh, doing it. And, uh, you know, uh, Vegas has been very good to me and very generous to me. And like I said, it's a very small towny feeling place. So people just kind of do stuff for each other all the time here. And, uh, and so, yeah, I didn't, I, I, I just thought if I can make it work, do it. So, and I could. So thank you for that. And the last time I was in town, I didn't actually talk to you, but it was your first ever like practice real real or i forget the term of it in, in show business of the i'm blanking on the name of the moment but your your uh the hillbilly show? the hillbilly yeah. magic show you did yeah the mind noodler uh now uh i've dropped the hillbilly part okay but that's just recent uh yeah that's a f- that's 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 definitely a, a been a been a crazier snowballing thing in my life right now for sure so if I can set this up from my perspective, sure, you've been doing the improv and working in a number of ways in entertainment that I don't know the extent of. And then at some point, you, you got this challenge or idea to really broaden your performance. And it's another thing that I admire about you just kind of going after something, putting yourself out there. So if you can better explain what you've done here in the last year or so. Yeah, I mean, it's been a very like a, a circling kind of trajectory to to kind of trying out magic, which is you know, uh, I co-host Penn Gillette's podcast, Penn Sunday School. Uh, what made me like a strength in the writers room for his TV shows and Penn and Teller TV shows is that I wasn't a variety performer, and I you know that I was just a, a regular guy, and so in the writers room, I was I was the better compass for like what regular people would do or wouldn't do or would know or wouldn't know. And then even sometimes writing for them, I'd be like, look, I don't know how to make a piece of fried chicken levitate, but it'd be really funny if we did this bit where a piece of fried chicken levitated, you know, <laughs> and they would just, you know, figure that out. Um, you know, I, uh, and then, then that, that got me, uh, that led to me writing on Penn and Teller Fool Us. Uh, Penn and Teller Fool Us uh, is, you know, where a bunch, uh, if you don't know, a bunch of magicians compete to try to fool Penn and Teller um, and then Penn and Teller perform themselves and, that led to me getting a absolute crash course in magic. So, like, this show recruits some of the best magicians of, from all over the world. And then I end up being around rehearsals and things like that for these magic tricks. And I end up learning a lot about magic. Well, then, while working on that, you know, um, you know, Penn's go, going through his metamorphosis with his weight. And all of a sudden, he's setting personal goals. And, you know, he's teaching himself a new thing. And so I always had in the back of my head, like, I should just learn how to perform, like, a magic trick, you know. But I didn't say that out loud to anybody. And then I saw this one performance on, on Fool Us, and it wasn't a terrible performance. It just was, like, I thought what the guy pulled off was pretty amazing. I thought the way he performed it was pretty safe or sterile, you know. Mm-hmm. And so I, I usually check in with Penn after each recording. And I said, like, kind of like, you know, a little, a little, a little brassy, just saying like, God, I feel like if I learn like four tricks, if that guy makes a living doing magic, I feel like if I learn like four tricks, I could just do what that guy does, you know. And uh, expecting Penn to be like, Hey, it's harder than you think, or like, 
you know, step, step back there, young man, <laughs> you know, kind of thing. He just goes, you're right. You should, you should learn, learn a trick, learn magic. And I was like, uh, and then the, we spent the remaining sessions of that season where I'd come up to him after performance, not talking about the show, but talking about different things I could do as a magician. And so suddenly I felt, I mean, I literally have Penn Gillette telling me how I should perform magic, you know? I shouldn't walk away from that and go do something else. Yeah. You know, I wasn't planning on getting into it. I was very much like neck deep in, in launching Matt and Manley's Ice Cream Social and uh, doing the bucket show and trying to get Paul and I out on cruise ships and stuff. And so I, it, it, it definitely was a left turn to what I was up to. But like, even like, I remember even talking to my therapist and my therapist was like, uh, if Penn's less telling you how to do magic and telling you you should do magic, uh, do magic. <laughs> so I was like, okay. And how long from the, the time that you and he started communicating about until you actually performed that first night that I was there, or like a year ago in December, I think it was. It was, yeah, a year ago December. And uh, it was, let's see, so Fool was probably wrapped around mid-March. And then I ended up uh, taking the plunge to learn magic in October, so however long that was. The reason why it took so long is because in the middle of doing all that stuff, I was also a full-time stage manager at Fifty Shades the Parody at Bally's uh, six nights a week. Now, I was miserable doing that job, um, but I uh, knew um, that I had another job coming up in February, and I was going to leave that job for the other job, but the show closed in October. So suddenly, I got two kids, and I have a, uh, a job in February, and I just don't know how to get a, a good enough job for October, November, December, January to get me to the new to, to the new job, which was I was on the creative team for the new for the Spiegel World Show Opium, which opened the Cosmopolitan, uh, helping create that show. Okay, and um, and I basically was like, well, Penn told me he would he would help me teach me a trick. I bet I know enough magicians. I bet if I went to each one of them and taught me to teach them and asked them just to teach me one trick, uh, I bet they would. And um, and I, and if I get six of them or seven of them to say yes, then I got seven tricks. That's enough to do a show. And so why don't I try to launch uh, like a crowdfunding campaign for uh, for a magic show? And for me as a writer, like I know because I mean seeing magicians and like again working on season after season of Fool Us, knowing what it takes to be a successful magician, I was very scared to just be me as a magician. And so I was like. Uh, through this other, you know, sketch, weird TV show thing that never went anywhere, I played a, a bumbling kind of hillbilly guy. And so I was like, what if I write for a nice, big, broad character? Um, I think it's easier to write for a character than it is to write for myself. And so, and I think also going to magicians and asking them to teach me a trick, having a big character will give them more of an idea of what they could teach me. And so I did that. Uh, and so I came up with Hillbill, the psychic Hillbilly. And I went to six magicians to ask them to teach me a trick. And because Penn said yes first and Teller said yes second, every other magician said yes. Because why the fuck wouldn't they? Right. And, and that was your line that they're, they're teaching me one. So what can you do for me? Or what, will you be willing to do this? And everyone just 100%. said it right away? Okay. Yep. yep. That's exactly it. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, so it's Penn Teller, Johnny Thompson, uh, Piff the Magic Dragon, uh, Brian Brushwood, Eric Dittleman, Matt King all taught me stuff on that first magic show. And how much time what, does it take to learn a one magic trick from these different minds that have something else, to, has something different to offer each one of them? Well, you know, like each one worked kind of differently and each one kind of checked in on me differently. But um, the thing that I really lucked out on was this guy, RJ Owens. Uh, who now is my co-host of my magic podcast, Africa Babble. Um, he, like, the weirdest circumstance, like the perfect circumstance happened, which is that he was a professional magician and made uh, and, and, and a huge magic nerd, like a major, major magic nerd. Uh, and someone who, uh, you know, most times when I meet like a magic nerd, I know because they just tell me how jealous and how they kind of hate me for how much access I have to amazing magicians that like I can call Johnny Thompson or I can call Penn or Teller to talk to them mm -hmm. and they just think that that's ridiculous and I'm I'm in, in spoiled and, 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 I'm, and I'm a jerk 
And he was joking. Well, are you? Yes. Okay. Uh, I definitely. I like I said like if I could the only thing that would the only thing that would make things right is a time machine, and I don't have one, so I can't help it. But I'm a guy with very little magic experience, but a huge huge comedy background. So I'm going to create comedy magic shows, and that's that. But R.J. Owens is really the thing is really the linchpin of why this is a successful project. He got hired by Cirque du Soleil to not do magic. He got hired by Cirque du Soleil to play the big the the, the main clown, a big giant uh, baby, in Mystere. And it's a job that pays very well and, and makes him uh, do 10 shows a week. And it's a creative outlet for him. And he's very funny. And he's he's the star of a show. So he doesn't do magic that often. And so when he heard that I was doing this, he basically was, you know, basically took me out for coffee, should start showing me magic tricks. And I was like, how much do you want to be involved? He's like, I want to be very involved. So I said, you want to direct the show? He said, yeah. And so RJ has been my director ever since. We're now building our second show. And he's directing that one. And with the previous show, you you had a number of shows here, but then it did well enough or whatever happened that you ended up traveling, touring a little bit as well. That's, again, I, I had the luckiest, this has the, been the luckiest trajectory uh, for anyone. So uh, Piff, Nitro Dragon, taught me a trick and, and then came and saw the show. And at the same time, his opener uh, went on to do another job. And so he had a, a, a slot open to have an opener for him on the road. And uh, Piff and I have always gotten along well personally. And so Piff the Magic Dragon took me on the road with him to 11 cities last year. And I did 60 shows performing, opening for Piff the Magic Dragon at comedy clubs across the country. And in my defense, I do have experience with comedy. And so uh, in terms of just grabbing a magician and taking him on the road, I was very comfortable in a comedy club environment. And one of the, I think one of the most valuable things I did to him for, for him is uh, I would come off stage after my opener thing and he has his intro video and we have a minute to talk. And in that minute, I would give him a breakdown of the audience, like where their energy was at, where the trouble spots were, if people were drunk or getting drunk or heckly. Okay. And I give him a quick little report on the audience each night I came off stage and told him what's what. And other times I'd even send some things and I'd be like, well, if I hop on this grenade now, I'm just the opener. And even if I come off as a dick, this will probably at least blow up and be done by the time Piff comes out and Piff can have a good show. So there are times where I'd really handle some drunk heckler or really go after someone who's being a dick uh, and sometimes making me less likable or less able to pull off a great magic show. But I didn't care as the opener and, and that was that. But I know I knew what it's like to MC and open in a comedy club. So uh, I liked I loved having that responsibility for Piff. It's fascinating. And I have a few other things I want to talk with you about here. But I just, I guess you mentioned the improv and how you got into that. But just the the idea to perform and in being in those situations, whether it's going very well or I'm sure there's moments where it's been about as bad as you'd ever want it to be. What is the continued drive to put yourself in that situation to be an entertainer? <laughs> It's a good question. I mean, you know, I don't, you know, when you're young, you want to be a star or you want to be famous or something, right? And I don't think I'm there anymore. And even while, even actually even now pursuing magic instead of other stuff is actually in that direction of, that, of being content to be a live performer and try to find a, a, a niche out here in Vegas and to not try to go out to L.A. and be some kind of actor or whatever, you know. I, was in, I went to a performing arts high school. I was an acting major in college and that kind of stuff. Um, and then you realize, like, you know, not to get too deep or whatever, but, like, I, I you know, I, I lost my mother as a young child. And so you feel like uh, years and years of therapy unravel that, like, you, you actually feel like you're entitled to success because of something like that happens. And also that, like, uh, you're a sympathy case. And so what you really want, why when you want fame... As a, as a young person, when you want rich and fame, what you really want is for people to not worry about you and for you to feel secure about going anywhere in the world and being treated a certain way. And it's really just like a total kind of like giant Band-Aid to go over insecurity than it is anything else. You know? it, and when did it stop being a Band-Aid and becoming maybe what it's developed into at this point in your life? I think as a, uh, in New York, as I became a much better teacher and improv instructor, when I started really going to get making other people 
uh, explode. You know, when I really kind of helped, really helped foster other people kind of um, unleash their inner performer. And I started, you know, coaching and directing and teaching and, and, um, and you know, um, realizing that every, every great improv theater, like huge out of Minneapolis, is a community. And realizing, like, how powerful and wonderful it was to be a part of a community um, that I kind of realized that I, that I could feel a um, artistic satisfaction without it being on a, on a large level, you know. And then, on the other hand, uh, I have no other skills. <laughs> I, spent, <laughs> I spent my whole life being around entertainment. The, the place where I can speak most articulately is, is figuring out a voice and entertaining. I mean, even as a writer, you know, I started off writing for Penn and Teller. And then I also wrote, you know, for Lisa Lampanelli, and I've written for other comedians. And I've written for other comedians' Twitter accounts, you know. And all that is a blast. Like, all that is about figuring out, like, their voice and finding their voice and, like, words they would use. And and it's even fun is when you're working with multiple accounts at the same time as you take, like, one news story and you figure out how each voice would talk about this one news topic and stuff like that and just try to how, to, how can you write this joke five different ways and those things are like a lot of fun, you know? And so, um, at the end of the day, like, even, like I said, I was on the creative team for a Vegas show. Like at the end of the day, like I have a certain skill set that's based on a knowledge of like, so people are going to sit down and watch this, you know? And like, what are you, how are you communicating to that audience? And that's what I've been working on my whole life. And so I think my skills would translate. Like when I was a stage manager and kind of a company manager, I could see that my skills translated in other ways, you know? Uh, but it's not the easiest thing to pursue. It's not the easiest way to jump over. So as much as starting my career over in magic sounds crazy, it's at least attached to what I'm doing. And so it doesn't feel as crazy in my household <laughs> to, to be pursuing that. So on to magic for as long as that takes you until, I guess, the next thing possibly. <laughs> but I, I, I'm going to go back to it, a, a question or a, the, 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 th the thought that you had that you have like no other skills. It just made me think, if you had to do something totally random, unrelated, but somehow would get a break to try it, is there something you've ever thought about doing? As I, I think, just where our minds go when we when we try to get away from our current yeah. existence. Yeah, I mean, you know, like funny enough, like what's strange is that in high school, before I found improv comedy, I was kind of like a really um, maniacal. Um, I'm a busy person, you know, and I'm a very creative person, but like. I actually was like Mr. Student Government. You know what I mean? Like I was president of my class and then president of my school. And then like, and I went to like these organizations where they, you know, like the future, future leaders of America kind of thing yep. and stuff. And so, um, that also meant that I like volunteered for like local election stuff and like keeping time for congressional debates in Jersey and things like that. And so, um, so which public office will you hold in the future? Matt <laughs> I think it's impossible for me to, I don't know. I guess, I guess our current, our current, uh, regime has changed the game, but I certainly have enough hor horribly insensitive jokes that I've made <laughs> on, uh, ice cream social that I think I can't run for office, but I still think I'd be good in, in a room of people trying to figure out how to get someone elected to office. So yeah. I feel like if I had to jump ship to another career, I think I would be okay working in politics i'd be a, i think I'd, i i think i'd be a fine speech writer i think i'd be a fine debate prepper i think those kinds of things well the thoughts there and seeing that you can change course quickly you never know but i think for now you've got other things to deal with. <laughs> it feels less fun it feels less fun to go there i mean you know i also was a bartender at irish tavern which i knew i could have done the rest of my life that was the strange thing it was, it was one of those one of those bars where it's like a lifer like I worked there for eight years at Tierney's Tavern in Montclair and I was still the new guy when I left. Like it's just the kind of place where it's like it's I called it a tree house with a deep fryer. Like it's it was just a perfectly nice, cozy job where you just made uh, plenty of cash to get through life. And uh, and I and I think the only reason why I left is because I was young enough to be like, gosh, it doesn't feel right to just see your whole life just laid out in front of you sitting in this bar. You know, exactly. But I miss it. You know, when I go back, he jokingly lets me go behind the bar and I'll I'll bartend for like a half hour, an hour. <laughs> but you could always get back into that or something similar if you ever wanted to. That's true. So it's it's not that hard to step away from, at least in that sense. I would That's imagine. true. 
I remember my buddy Pat and I when we were uh, we were both actors in the city and friends when we were younger. We did improv when we were kids. He was part of Improv Jam, and uh, I remember like you know when you're young, like the idea of being thirty and not knowing something is like daunting, you know, like and so we were like if we haven't if we haven't hit by the time we're thirty you and I were joining the fire department, you know, like we're going to become firemen, you know? Uh, and then just, you know, as you get closer to 30, you're kind of like, Oh, a lot of people still don't know what they're doing at 30. <laughs> and so it didn't feel as dire. See, I, and this, I think will transition to a very unrelated topic, but kind of related now that you say that is I had sent you an email earlier today. And I, I know you got a, a little bit of a chance to look at this article, an article that I think, well, I will share it in the show notes. And I'd like anyone that's listened to this to really take the time to read this article because it, I realize of all the reasons I have this podcast, I think it's this. There's a term called intellectual humility, which is something that I feel like I figured out the last few years Yeah, that I just I want to explain this path I've had in my life in a few years to people through a podcast, through some of the people that I've met that have helped me realize where I may be wrong about something. And that's kind of the purpose of me having this. And I have a being wrong segment, which we'll get to shortly. Yeah. And we'll learn what Matt Donnelly now says that he was wrong about. But I find that I'm afraid that some people just give no thought to what they might currently be wrong about. Whereas I probably spend too much time trying to be aware of what I might be wrong about. But... The idea that we know anything necessarily is just is, is another aspect of that, that we all we all kind of think we know what's going on and at different degrees. But some people are just certain of it and some people are much less confident. And I just the idea that we look at this, some people look at it in one way, some people never consider it. And I feel like it's one of the biggest methods to learning is being willing and capable of being wrong. Oh, I being wrong is so important. Um and I always say, like, being, you know, uh, failure is not a mistake. If, if you're learning from failure, you haven't made a mistake. And failing is a huge part of the learning process. You learn so much more by failing than you do by uh, um, uh, achieving. And I think, like, a, like a concrete example to me is, like, uh, YouTube stars. You know, you have these young kids who start YouTube channels and they blow up. And they have no idea why they're successful. And so when they keep making videos or don't make videos or when they try to change direction of what they're doing or try to cross over from YouTube into television or something like that, like you find these, these kids have no bearing as to like what actually makes them amazing. And it's because they haven't failed, you know? And so, uh, yeah, failure is a huge part of it. And part of the reason, even when funny people kind of go like, you know, or go through improv classes or, or they go through an improv program and they, Oh, I went through level one, two, three and four and five and now I'm done. No, no. Like, what you what you have in an improv class is like a place to fail, and like you can go out there try to be funny, suck, and it has no bearing on your reputation uh, as to where you can get hired, as to do whatever. And so it's like I still get in the classroom. Like Paul and I went and taught uh, at Louisiana uh, this last weekend uh, at Northwestern State University. And they, they had uh, odd numbers. And so Paul was teaching an exercise, and I hopped in and did Paul's exercise with, um, with, a, with a college kid. And, uh, and then I learned something. <laughs> I learned something doing Paul's exercise. And I was like, this is great. I got to, like, screw around with some college kid, and, and I learned something again. And so, like, yeah, like, uh, not only failing, but, like, then knowing that and then finding, like, where is my place to fail? These bucket shows I'm putting together right now, like the, why we put four together in a row, is because I need, because <laughs> in five weeks, I need to do these two magic tricks really well. And so these four weeks are here for me to do magic tricks for those audiences where I don't have to do it really well, where I can fuck up, you know? And so, like, finding your, your low stakes performance environments is a really key to development, you know? Where can I fail? And then learning that when you fail, that it's nothing to like emphasize as to worry about, be concerned with and move on from it. So I, I, I guess performance is one thing, but also just intellectually when we think that we know something and then later begin to realize, maybe I don't actually know this and can admit it. And I feel like in this podcast, I've already admitted a few things publicly that I'm, I'm I used to, I just 
I had an idea that I thought was right, and it's not. I'm getting better at that. It's scary right away to, to hey, tell people, oh, I, I, I used to think this, or I, I do think this now, and maybe I'm not sure about it. Yeah. Podcasting? You like what's what's the term again? Intellectual intellectual humility. Intellectual humi- humility is a must in podcasting because there's something about like you know you're putting this out and that it has a platform and you and I have experienced media where you know journalism uh, journalists is, or is, there's some, there's something much more prep involved for this same media space that you're occupying. Yeah, and so like you naturally in the back of your head are going like, wait, I'm saying this, but I haven't researched this. You know, and so you are automatically going like, uh oh. And then if you have a following and if you have like, you know, you know a social media for people to, or an email for people to reach out to you, people correct you. People put you in your place pretty hard, you know. And, 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 and I remember I used to speak much more boldly in my first early episodes of Ice Cream Social. And then uh, my listeners didn't like look up to me. So they talked to me like, like, like a stranger at a bar or just someone who just knew something and was like, hey, just so you know, you're, you're just wrong about this thing. <laughs> like, oh, yeah, I am, you know. Uh, and but, that's refreshing uh, to be told you're wrong and be able to, to just be okay with being wrong. Definitely. And I mean, I actually, it was funny is that then knowing who I am and my relationship with my listeners, I started saying like, hey, be nice about it. <laughs> I'm a sensitive person. So I have no problem being corrected. Just know that I want to be and therefore be real nice about it when you do it. And then that's agreements worked really well across the board. Um. You know, I remember just like a really dumb thing. Someone had told me that the peanut butter and jelly sandwich was invented for the Air Force because it was protein and carbohydrates in a, in a packaging that didn't need to be refrigerated, that traveled well, and so therefore it was an easy meal to like give to people who had to, you know, go off and be on a journey or something like that. Okay. Exactly. I, I, I never thought to research this at all. Yep. And just believe that my whole life. I don't even remember who told me. And I started singing the podcast <laughs> and all these people in the Air Force are like, what the fuck are you talking about? <laughs> That's but, not true at all. That I think happens maybe not all the time, but a lot to us. We, we just we think we know something as fact, but we've never researched it. And then at some point, we're going to realize that some of these things that we think are facts are, are not correct. The more we actually talk to people and put ourselves out there, it, it's, it gives an opportunity yeah. to realize the things that we just think we know, but we do not know at all. No, yeah, exactly. And so I think like podcasting helps that happen too. And I think, you know, uh, that we also live in a time where like it's easy to get down on humanity in that thing that like the most, the brashest liar can just double down their way through life, you know, but I think along that comes with that is the people who don't like that quality want to be held accountable or hold themselves accountable. And so I feel like I am seeing it and also an equal increase in uh, intellectual humility as well. And people that I like and respect. I think it's happening. And now at least I have a name for it and I'm going to, in future episodes, I think we revisit this and talk to more people about it and try to get a better grasp for myself and a, and a listening audience. But Matt, at this moment, for the being wrong segment, is there something that you're willing to out yourself about that you you used to be wrong about it? Oh, I mean, I don't even know where to begin. (laughs) Wherever you want to begin. Uh, I'm trying to think like, I mean, I used to really mouth off about like religion is corrupt, but I'm a spiritual person. So I went through that phase for a while. (laughs) I feel like I'm really wrong about that. Um, You know. Uh, but that's, yeah, I don't know if I want to go that direction. I would say that this, like, I remember, like I was an improv purist my whole life and I watched my friends go off and become famous while I actually dedicated myself to like teaching and instead of trying to become a writer earlier, you know? And, um, and I told myself that like this improv is so beautiful because you perform it and you throw it away forever. Uh, and that makes it like so much more of like a pure art form. And, um, it's funny that like the, what having now been a podcaster for the last, you know, six or seven years, um, having a, a body of work and now working on magic shows, like having a body of work is, is, is nice. And it is, is, it is a cool thing to have and it feels good, especially as you get older 
throwing away everything in your 30s doesn't feel as good as throwing away everything in your 20s. <laughs> um, and so I, uh, I was really, I think I was, I, I was not right that I was, I could have been happy as like a, almost like a, a, in a monk-like pro art state of comedy. I thought I could be happy there. And I think I found out that that wasn't true as I got older. Well, in that situation, and I think many situations in life, we are currently, or we're doing something and then we best explain it away to make ourselves feel like it's the best thing for us or the right thing to do. And it's very possible the way that we explain something at one point in our life, we come to a new realization and, it, and that drastically changes and sounds like... Yeah, like it's, you know, it's like, it's, and it just comes with, you know, like, not that you should judge yourself by how other people treat you, but it's just a matter of like when you check in with people, you know? So I run to someone from high school, I run to someone from college and they go like, are you still doing that improv thing? And I'm like, yeah, you know? And they're kind of like, oh, <laughs> like they're not like impressed by that at all not as excited about it as you are and then you're like but and you want to like point to something and you can't you know and it's funny because you're like you're like hey are you still podcasting and you're like yeah we just finished episode 500 and so and so with this person as a guest and we have this many downloads and we just did this festival you know and like and all of a sudden you're like you can point to these things that go like yeah and it's been getting better and better each year and i know it has <laughs> you know <laughs> and so like there's something about having a a a and it's it's i'm making it sound like it's an outward thing but it really is like an inward thing of like it's it, it feels good to have benchmarks for when you're being insecure that you like no 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 you can't beat yourself up too much you've still done this that and the other thing and so uh it's hard. I didn't, I don't, I didn't, I, it's just a personal thing. I didn't have the spiritual constitution it took to, to really just be content with just teaching improv my whole life, which I thought that's what I was going to do. Well, I'm glad that you're continuing to learn about yourself and getting to this point where you're at. And, does and that guess, count? Does this count for the being wrong? Yeah, that no, good? that does. I, okay. I, it's a clear point of you changing your perspective totally on something that you were quite confident if about. If you're listening to the other episodes and you don't think that counts, then just remember when I told you about the peanut butter and jelly thing. I admitted that, right? I was wrong. <laughs> I was wrong about the peanut butter and jelly thing. And so that counts then. So I feel like I've hedged, I've hedged enough. There's a few. And I, I imagine <laughs> if, if people begin to listen to any of your mini podcasts, and I'll let you, I'll go, you go, go down the list of all the things you're working on that someone might, you might want, or someone, if they want to find you, what they might be interested in. All right. The whole list is that uh, as a magician, I'm Matt Donnelly, Mind Noodler. I'm at Mind Noodler on, uh, on Twitter and Instagram uh, and Facebook. Uh, and uh, with the Mind Noodler, I have this podcast. It's like a subscription only. It's a dollar. Uh, but it's because we talk very candidly about magic. And so I, it's that, that way I can't have magicians just Google it and bust my chops. Mm -hmm. But um, uh, that's Abracababble. It's brand new. I just put up episode 11. Um, uh, but uh, uh, the, the mo mo in the podcast universe, uh, like I said, the, the one that kicks ass is the comedy. Is It's a nonsense podcast. Me and my comedy partner, Paul Mattingly, uh, my improv comedy partner of, of 10 years, uh, we do Matt and Mattingly's Ice Cream Social. We've done 540 episodes. We put out two a week. They're all about an hour, an hour and a half long. They're ridiculous. They are silly. Uh, it is what we, we, we always say is that the, the world is so many serious things in the world. We know you take the right things seriously. So we just offer you a timeout from all that. We never tackle anything um, crazy. We literally just do silly, silly bits. Um, and my comedy partner is, uh, like I said, he's either a 70-year-old woman or a 12-year-old boy about everything. <laughs> and so uh, I do that. And then I also co-host Penn Gillette's podcast, Penn Sunday School. Well, Matt Donnelly, thank you for those. I will put them all into the show notes so it, it's easier for people to find them. And they just click in and hop over well, to me. I knew you were going to do that. I wouldn't have taken all the time. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> well, Matt, thanks for taking the time with me today. And thank you, uh, Kurt, continued man. success you in all these uh, ventures, podcasts, and in the real world that you're working on. Thank oh, you. thanks. Well, thanks, pal. Thanks for listening to People I Know Show. Find links to the Intellectual Humility article and much more about Matt Donnelly in the show notes. Links are also there for the People I Know Show Facebook and Instagram accounts. Please take a few moments to rate and review the show on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen. If you like the show, please encourage someone new to listen or share your favorite episode on social media. And feel free to email your feedback directly to me, Kurt Carstensen, by using the email address 
peopleiknowshow at gmail.com. Thanks for listening.